Hi, everyone. I'm Akash, the uh, CEO of Airtime, your fast lane to product validation. And today, I'll be talking to Molly Stevens about democ democratizing user research. And Molly is the senior director of UX at Booking.com. She has over 20 years of super relevant experience for us from companies like Uber or Google or Booking, for instance. Molly, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, I'd like to hand over the mic to you and to tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you. Uh, really appreciate the warm welcome and hearing a bit about, um, you know, the people and seeing the chats come in from all the different places. That's really exciting. Um, so, yeah, uh, Molly Stevens, I've been in the field. Um, uh, yeah, uh, it's kind of scary to say, but over 24 years at this point, um, which uh, I'm de definitely dating myself. Um, but the uh, yeah, so I've been primarily a user researcher. So I started out my career doing design and research uh, at a couple of consulting companies. Then I moved to Google where I was a full time researcher for eight years in New York City and Shanghai, China, uh, and then eventually California. Uh, then for one year, I was a product manager at a startup. Uh, so I got to see what that experience was like. Uh, and then I quickly moved back to research and user experience uh, where I was at Uber. And uh, about four years ago, I moved uh, to Booking, uh, where now I lead the design, writing and research teams uh, for all of our products and services. Um, fun fact, uh, my first job at Google was working on Google Newspaper, which was a attempt to try and get all of Google's um, digital uh, advertisers to buy print ads in Google, in newspapers that they had made deals with. Um, uh, as you can imagine, that didn't go very far, <laughs> um, but it was a very interesting project and a way of thinking about um, uh, all the different kinds of advertising and, you know, that type of communication out to customers and how to make it relevant uh, and the difference between digital and print. It was a really interesting place. Amazing. Thanks a lot for sharing. And um, one of the first topics that I'd, I'd like to focus on with you today is um, it revolves around one of the articles that you wrote. And uh, I read that uh, a few weeks ago. And in this article, you bring an anecdote when uh, you had a chat with uh, one of your colleagues and you asked them if uh, uh, and, and that, that colleague was from from data sciences uh, mm -hmm. and and you asked them if um, if other colleagues argued that they could do their job because many product managers or, or just other roles they said well we can talk to customers anybody can talk to users what's so special about that and um, i was ju i was just wondering what's your uh, if you could expand on this story a little bit and this perception of well, user research is just easy. Anybody can just do it. Yeah. So, yeah, this, I think the the topic had been bubbling for me for a while because um, at the time that this comment happened, there was a lot of, um, a lot of discussions happening about democratizing research, right? Democratizing research in quotes, I would say, because, um, you know, it was... <clears throat> all about making um, making it possible for everyone at your business to do research. Um, and I think that I, I'd started to feel that it was, um, it was kind of missing the nuances uh, of, of what doing research meant. Um, and I was talking with this colleague um, and it, it occurred to me that um, maybe the uh, complexity of research wasn't being surfaced often enough, right? And that, you know, we don't talk to someone in data science or um, front-end engineering or other places. And, and um, like, our assumption is, is that their work involves complexity or it involves things that perhaps as a newbie, I would make some really potentially risky mistakes with. Um, and um, it was it was just a very uh, eye opening moment that put together a bunch of pieces in my head that had been coming together for a while um, to say, you know, what is the value of research training? How can we make that visible? Right. Um, you know, we are 
we have a lot to offer as a research and a discipline, but what is that exactly? And how can we talk about it in a way that um, doesn't eliminate the um, value of people having firsthand contact with customers? I'm a big believer in that, but it also doesn't mean you're quote, doing research, right? Um, and so that's a distinction I've started to make. Yeah, is it is it a fair comparison? Like uh, when I uh, when I read your article, I thought it's it's a bit like uh, your argument is a bit like running. Like I can just uh, pull up my shoes and go out and run, or opposed to as opposed to like climbing, where you need a lot of exercise to even get started. And it gives you the this false idea that well, if I can get easily started, it means I can do it. Yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah. and. Yeah, if anyone could go out the door and run, but how far, how fast are you going to be able to compete? Are you going to hurt yourself while you're doing it? <laughs> right? Like, there's all kinds of things that um, you get from benefit from being an expert, from ha having been trained. Um, and so for me, um, you know, you think about all of those things for research, right? Um, Researchers are typically faster than non-researchers. We can choose the right method for what you're trying to understand. We're probably more adept at pulling insights out of both um, you know, observed behavior and spoken words or data that you're collecting. Um, and we can also really lean on that expertise to help companies avoid misinterpretation, which is the biggest risk. Right. Um, if you aren't talking to the right people and you haven't collected the right data, um, the risk to decision making can be quite high. So it's, yeah. uh, it's something mm -hmm. to keep in mind. I, I love the list that you brought, and I and I wanted to ask if we could transpose it and from the from the eyes of a of a non researcher, like yeah. what are, or what are the risks for a company to to like give research tasks, uh, sometimes sophisticated research tasks in the hands of a, of a non-researcher? Non yeah, there's a lot of biases that can creep in, right? Um, so I think the biggest one that we, um, we often see is that someone who, like a, a product manager, has basically designed a, a preliminary design for a product, um, and they'd like to get feedback on it. Um, but how you present that, how you talk to people about your involvement in it and how you actually phrase your questions can really bias how people respond to that, right? Um, so from a psychological perspective, there's the bias um, to please people, right? So if I know that you, um, that this is your baby, and I am probably going to be less likely to tell you that your baby is ugly um, or that it doesn't function the way I want it to, right? Whatever this thing is. Um, whereas um, the nice thing often about research is we can be a little more neutral and we can say, tell me, you know, tell me about your first impression of this thing. And if people hesitate, you can say, look, it's it's not my baby. Right. Like I want to I want to make something for you that's really honest, uh, that's really awesome and great. And please be honest with me about it. And then people can kind of calm down and settle into it. Um, unfortunately, um, it's kind of hard to observe that in yourself, right? Unless you spent a lot of time uh, training yourself to be in that kind of neutral space. Yeah, is is there like any any story or anecdote that you can pull from your from your stash uh, of of anecdotes uh, that relate to this? Like someone not not qualified in a particular uh, research method, doing and running, and then you. Uh, well, I think, I mean, I think you can, you, you can observe it. I, I've seen it a lot, so I don't have actually one specific yeah. one. Um, I can say that uh, there was one project I was on where I was uh, in my early career, where I was both the designer and the researcher. So I had to fulfill both roles. And I remember it being very hard to take feedback that was negative about what I had designed. <laughs> right. So like, I was like, I was like, you know, really wanted to be like, do you like it? you know, doing the restaurant nod. I don't know if you've heard of this, but it's a psychological trick that servers use at restaurants when they ask you if you want dessert. So they say, do you want dessert? Uh, and they try and get you to say yes to it. Um, unfortunately, we give a lot of unconscious body signals when we're asking for approval. And so you have to really hold yourself back sometimes um, when you're actually asking uh, for feedback. 
um, from people, right? Or you say, do you like it rather than um, tell me your first impression? Um, also, you can ask uh, closed questions rather than open ones, right? So instead of asking, um, tell me your first impression, which is a more of an open-ended question, right? You're not asking, you're, you say, um, would you use this? And they'd say no. And that's all the information you get. <laughs> so as telling me your first impression, they might say, well, I don't, I don't see how this is useful. I don't know. And okay, tell me more. Why, why not? What gives you that impression? And then you can dig into it, right? Um, so there's definitely a lot of kinds of questions um, that uh, you have to be thoughtful about how you how you bring them into the feedback gathering process. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, let's zoom out from the from the personal level and think, uh, and I'm, I'd like to tap into your experience how organizations uh, should like structure uh, the work of the yeah. research work in, in companies and distribute this between research teams and non researchers yeah. uh, to have like to to maintain a high quality of uh, of insights. Yeah, so I I think every company is different and topics vary, right? Um, so it depends on how you think about the elements, right? Um, so I do believe that every company should be in contact with their customers. It's a hugely valuable for people to see firsthand where people are using your tools, where they, where they might be using their tools or encountering the things, how are they using the data that might come out of it? Um, and, and kind of think about that as you're building things or you're making decisions. Um, the, you know, I, I'll tell you an anecdote. The very first thing that I designed coming out of uh, my graduate, my master's program was a tool for real estate agents to upload listings to be printed in a, it's called the real estate book. It was based in Atlanta um, and I designed a website for it and I had my prototype uh, and I, at the time, so this is 2002 or so, um, most websites had a home page, but I didn't really think about the fact that people were selling homes. So when they came in to use the site for the first time and they're like home, but home, like it's just the wording wasn't right. And I hadn't been thinking about it from the point of view of a real estate agent. Now, if I had talked to a real estate agent earlier on, that might have been more on my mind, but I hadn't had that exposure before I designed it. Um, and that was a real good, that was a very good learning for me, a real world example for how that exposure would have been helpful. I didn't have to do research to discover that. I needed to get feedback. I needed to be in that uh, zone with the customers. Now, as you, as you break down what I would call that to me is a big rock. That's a big, obvious thing that's a blocker that you can just sweep away and, and make a change to. Now, if you have a workflow or something that's um, riskier, if people don't actually complete it or can't figure out how to make it happen, um, the stakes go up, right? Um, the the challenges, if, if you don't ask the question right, or if you don't have the right target audience doing the testing, then um, you might um, might make a big mistake that's hard and costly to roll back. Um, I've seen some examples on LinkedIn of um, surveys that have gone out that have really poorly worded questions um, or um, very leading questions. And if you survey a thousand customers and you use this data to make decisions about how you're targeting certain kinds of advertising or certain product market launches, um, that can be a hugely, hugely costly mistake. Um, so some of it depends on the method, some of it depends on the context of the product, and some of it depends on the customers. Uh, I hear you. I, I, I'd still like to pin a few, a few things on the wall. Sure. Um, for are, are there like any special, and I'm just going to throw in a few research methods, and I'm curious how you think about should the, like researchers do them, can PMs or product designers in, in your opinion, and you don't have to be categorical. I'm just curious where, where you position. And uh, so some of the 
most common methods that I come across are, let's say, discovery interviews, usability tests. You also mentioned surveys. Um, let's stick to these three for the for the time being. Um, what are your thoughts on them? Yeah, so I think discovery interviews um, are fairly low risk to a certain degree because it, you're probably doing a number of them, right? So you might start to see trends. It's also something that it's good if you have multiple people sitting in on it, right? So they can kind of learn from each other. You can also make sure that your interview guide is um, structured or semi-structured so that you have the right questions to ask. Um, usability tests, I think, are can be harder, but don't, you know, aren't, don't, like we at Booking, we have a list of methods that some of which we um, are, are okay for people in the business to use on their own. Um, some are okay only after training, um, and some are not okay unless a researcher does it. Um, user interviews the initial interviews are usually with training um, so that we teach people how not to ask leading questions and how to analyze the data. Um, we use usertesting.com quite a bit. And so um, for that, we also do training, but your um, interview method also still has to be reviewed by a researcher, um, mostly because um, it's expensive on both sides, both in terms of decision-making and just spending business money. Uh, and then surveys, the surveys was the third one. Is that right? Surveys were the third one. Yeah. So we don't let anyone but researchers have survey accounts at Booking <laughs> because we've seen uh, big, fairly expensive um, surveys. And they're not only expensive for cost, right? Because you usually pay a completion per cost with one of the larger vendors. Um, but they're also uh, costly in terms of customer time. Right. So if we can only get customers to fill out two surveys a year and everyone at the business is sending out a survey and no one's sharing the data with each other, even if it's good data, um, then it's um, too costly for the business. Right. So we just really don't allow that um, in our business context. OK. OK. So if, if this was a sink the ship game, I, I, I hit one in the bucket of only researchers uh, can do it and another one uh, that are in trainings. What are what are some 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 examples for research types where, where you the you feel that a non researcher, be it like a, 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 let's say a product manager can fairly safely engage in that, do that and get the necessary exposure to customers and feedback? Yeah, so it it depends. Some of the things that we um, that we encourage people to do is um, like job shadowing, customer support shadowing, um, interviews if they have the training or if they have at least some background or have read, you know, done something to learn about how um, how they can remove their biases, right? Um, I've been criticized at points for gatekeeping about research, like trying to keep people out of doing kinds of research. But you have to understand the risk on the other side, right? I'm not saying that you can't do it. You can go out and, you know, try something, right? But what is the decision that you're trying to make and how risky is it if you bring back data that's tainted from a variety of ways, right? And it's just one of the things you have to keep in mind. There's also a lot of laws and rules in different countries about how you collect personal data, how you store it, um, GDPR and all of those things. And so that's also something that we include in our trainings so that we're not putting the business at risk um, for litigation. But if I were to say, I mean, there's so many different kinds of research or investigation that you can do, but what we typically um, encourage people to do is um, taking early stage concepts or designs, sitting with people, um, asking them unbiased questions, getting early stage feedback, because that can really point you in the right direction, right? It's a very, um, very high velocity work is what I call it. So I'm not, um, I believe that we shouldn't just move fast, but we should move fast in a direction. And that's velocity, not speed. Um, and that's what 
that's what product teams want is they want velocity. Um, because if you're just running in random directions and hitting walls, that's no good for anybody. So you should be collecting feedback, relying on your research partners or people that you hire to do it to do the really precise things or things that involve large groups of folks or that involve um, uh, really target target users, right? Um, so, um, so that you're mitigating the risks and you make sure like you don't want to move fast in the wrong direction. Um, that's the, the worst of all. Yeah, I, I love that you brought up the example of, of shadowing. It uh, reminds me, my uh, wife is, um, she's a head of marketing or she used to be in, in e-commerce platforms. And one of the things, she was, she's not a user researcher, but what she does when every, every time she joins a new company, she, and if, if this company has a store, mm -hmm. she sits and works from the store in the first month for a few days. And this is also what she expects from, yeah. from her team just to see what people, when they come in, what do they look at? Uh, what questions do they ask from the, from the like uh, shop assistants? And it's full of insights. And I think yeah. it's like shadowing is something that at least in the bubble that I'm in, it rarely pops up as a, as, as one of the, one of the methods, but it's extremely valuable and deep uh, insights that you can get from there. Yeah. And I think um, shadowing or um, having, um, having people from different parts of the business watch a user test or participate in some kind of feedback, um, they have very different contexts that they bring to that that help you as a researcher or a designer or whoever understand something new, right? Um, so I remember um, uh, I used to work on a very large ads product uh, at Google and um, watching um, some of our uh, some of our larger uh, advertising customers use our tools uh, and the things that I learned from what our, our um, engineers were saying about how the tool worked was um, and how that person was shortcutting a bunch of things and how fascinating it was. I learned a ton about the, the domain and the product and everything. Um, so I'm definitely a big fan of that as well. Sweet. Thank you. I have a, um... I have another topic which I wanted to um, cover, which is um, earlier stage companies. And and when we think of like seed stage companies or mini series A stage uh, companies, they don't necessarily have a user researcher. We could, I'm sure we could pull even statistics uh, on, on like from the first 20 or 30 employees, how many uh, are researchers in companies and what's the distribution. But my point is, uh, for these companies, they're looking for product market fit. Um, it's essential for them to understand, have a deep understanding of user needs. And they are the ones who direly need this research skills, what may, may not be on board because of budget or, or other issues. What's your like, uh, I guess you won't have a silver bullet, but what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah. what, are, what are some good practices uh, and approaches they could have uh, in the absence uh, of a researcher? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I've uh, I've advised startups in the past um, on how to think about where and and how to explore product market fit. Um, I think that there's scrappy ways to do it. Um, like I said, if you can um, find ways to help train yourself to be more unbiased, that's a helpful thing because we're not. I'm. <laughs> I'm not going to stop people from going out and talking to their customers. That's fine. Uh, but what I'm hoping to do is to get people to think about the things that they don't know that that could affect the outcome. Right. Um, and so thinking about ways that they can unbias themselves or collect that data in that way or finding ways to bring in a researcher on a key project or a key element of something that's going to be happening. Right. Um, one of the startups I was advising, um, they uh, found an intern. They had a summer intern come and work with them as a researcher. And at the end of the summer, I remember the founder was like, I, I will never build anything without a researcher again. He was just like, I learned so much. I have such a deep knowledge now of our customers. I assumed so many things about how people behave. And now I know I was wildly wrong. Um, 
And actually, he just chatted me today and said they've hired her again to help with um, a big launch that they have coming up now. So you might not be able to hire someone as your, you know, full time person. But I do think that investing in a few moments when you really have to it's 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 that strong expertise. Right. If you're launching a new brand, you can build it yourself. But like if you got a brand expert and you spent that five thousand dollars on getting top notch branding, et cetera, maybe it's worth it for what you're trying to accomplish. And I feel like research is the same. OK, OK, so paraphrasing what you said, like don't cut corners by doing a scrappy job, but it, like for decisions that really are vital for your company, try yeah. to pull in on a on a, on a need uh, as needed basis, uh, mentorship, um, advisory, Inherent, whatever form. Yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. because, um, you know, you need useful, usable Right. What is it? Useful, usable, and uh, <laughs> am I forgetting the three the three circles? Right. You need all of them uh, to be together, and you don't have that if you don't have research. So, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Molly, we talked about a lot of stuff today, and I have a thousand more questions, but I also see questions coming in from the audience, and I I want to make sure that it's not me dominating the entire discussion, but they can it's tap useful. into your mind. Useful, yes. usable, and desirable. And desirable, right? of course. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, if you had to pick like uh, three three things that we remember, we should remember from this discussion today. What would be your three points? Um, the first is um, that I do think everyone should be gathering feedback. I do think that um, and feedback versus research. So. Feedback is you're going out, you're talking to people, you're collecting data points. Um, research is collecting evidence, uh, data that turns into you know, actionable insights. So everyone should be thinking about feedback and gathering it. The second is uh, thinking about the context in which you're working. How, um, how important is this? How complex are your customers? How complex is the space that you're working in? Um, and then the, the last one is about risk. So what's the risk to your business, to your decision making? You know, um, one of the one of the examples I've <clears throat> uh, that comes uh, was in a blog post someone posted was, you know, uh, uh, engineering and product come to a researcher and say, we have a new uh, we have a new menu. You know, we think we'd like to do A-B testing on. Um, but we might do research before we launch it. We're not sure. And the researcher says, well, it'd probably take me about two weeks to recruit some people, get some feedback and get your report. And they say two weeks, like and we could, we could post this, right. And, and we could get feedback in two weeks, but how big is the change? You know, how many customers could you lose? Um, a-B testing isn't free, right? It costs you engineering cycles to build it. It costs you engineering cycles to run it on the on the um, servers. So like, how do you balance those things out and think about the risk? And if waiting two weeks doesn't make sense, then A-B test it. It's not, I mean, it's fine. There's probably plenty of other things to research, but that that's a false, uh, if it's just about time, then you know you haven't really thought through the risk and the context and how to make it make those work in your favor. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think that's it. I'm I'm gonna pick a first question from Zana because well, your last sentence is a perfect a segue to that. Uh, uh, and um, the question is about how to decide which research method to, to use for for which study, and if you could give us a, a few examples. <laughs> Yeah, so um, what used to happen to me early in my career is people would come to me and they'd say, um, Molly, I need a usability study, <laughs> which um, all researchers have heard. And then you would say, okay, um, what are you trying to discover, right? And so uh, what I learned from my mentor, one of my mentors at Google, Michael Margulis, is um, what he called starting at the end. So you say, what is the data? that you need to make your decision. Um, and 
if it's a uh, big data, you need big numbers and you need to understand the market and you need to have more of an understanding of your audience and how they're reacting to things, you probably need to do a survey. All right, because if uh, talking to four to six people is not going to convince anyone of the direction, uh, then you probably need something more concrete. Um, if you need what we call thick data, so you need to understand how people um, experience your product, you maybe want to do a usability test or field work or watch people in situ using a phone or an app, then probably um, doing one-on-ones, um, doing um, things in, in the wild in cafes or whatever uh, are okay. And then you'd want to um, focus your questions and your approach on um, the data you need. So you say, this is the data, this are the kinds of questions I need to ask, uh, and you work your way back to the, to the method that will help you gather that data. Um, so it really depends on a lot on what you wanna do with it at the end. Cool, thank you. We're gonna uh, go to, the, to another topic that we um, already covered to some extent today, which is related uh, to early stage startups uh, and um, your recommendations how to leverage data analysis, for instance. Uh, yeah, this is a very complex question. <laughs> um, I think, um, I mean, I think that similarly is like, um, like if you're, if you're going to do a data analysis, what you have to figure out is what are, what are the, the elements or pieces of data that matter to your outcome, right? So I remember early in my career, I did a, um, a series of 35 or 36 one-on-one -on -one interviews with people to better understand um, how they were using their internet at home, basically. Um, and as we went along, we started seeing how we needed to um, analyze that data, what was going to be important to the outcome. Um, although at the beginning, we also knew that it mattered um, what channel they were contacting customer support, because that ultimately is where we were headed. So I think that um, it depends a bit on the data you're collecting um, and the ultimate outcome. So you can use customer journey maps, you can use um, the, the elements you note here about the five whys or swim lane diagrams. You can use um, uh, customer statements that say, I use blah because blah, and then you know fill those in with each of your interviews kind of core statements and then see which of those match and which ones don't. Um, so you can use all these tools, I guess, um, again, to get to context is like, what are you trying to, what is the question or story, question you're trying to answer or the story you're trying to tell with that data, right? Because you can, um, like if you talk to a data scientist about um, customer segmentation, they can, they can segment them many, many ways. Right. There, there was a tool we had at Uber that used to help us segment drivers so we knew if they drove in the morning or the afternoon or overnight. Right. It was a tool. But my question always was, what will we do with that? <laughs> like, are we going to change the product right. based off of what, what time of day they drive? Are, we're going to message to them probably differently based on what time they're going to drive. But like, what does this visualization help us understand about drivers and their behavior and their motivations? And it isn't always super clear, even though you can segment them that way, it doesn't necessarily give you a clear answer. So mm -hmm. um, on, on, on these frameworks, oh, sorry. Uh, I don't have a perfect answer for this, but I think that it has a lot to do with the story you wanna tell with the visualization. Yeah, and I think you also plotted some some really good like frameworks and method methods. Uh, an add-on question here: What are your thoughts on opportunity scoring? Um, like in terms of scoring it based off of some kind of opportunity. Yeah, you, let's say using for like um, uh, valid, like prioritizing upcoming features. Uh, yeah. 
So that can be super helpful. Um, I've done opportunity scoring on a two by two matrix where also you um, make the like the ball that maybe you place the the features and you make the ball that's the feature the size of how much work it is, right? So you not only see the opportunity in terms of how important it is to customers and how um, maybe how quickly it can be done, but also how big it is. So you get to see them in relationship to each other. I've also had, um, that makes me think of one, one that I think is an interesting thing and actually one that um, helps with product managers is also people will sometimes say, um, you know, please look at all these features and tell me which one you want. Well, most people will say, I want them all, right? <laughs> or like, you know, why would, why would I have to choose? Um, but it's always to give them, let's say a hundred dollars and say, if you had a hundred dollars and you could put it against any of these, and you could put this against features, where would you distribute it? Now, the interesting, that's interesting in where they distribute it. But then the most interesting thing is why, why right? yeah. you put, you put $40 on this feature and 20 on these others. Why? Like, tell me more about that, why it's so important. And then you get a great story and you can dig into that a lot. Cool. Thanks for sharing. Um, let's move on to the next one. Uh, and the question is from Lauren about uh, how do you convince uh, the business to prioritize user research? Uh, so what I've seen work in the past on teams is that they start small to identify a few questions that perhaps um, no one quite knows what the answer is. And you say, okay, well, let's go talk to two customers and see if we can get some feedback. Uh, and you bring people along with you. So you're not asking for a full study or hiring a contractor or hiring a person entirely, but you start to make inroads on how um, having this third party point of view helps people make quicker decisions. And then you can start to tell the story of how, wow, if we could more quickly answer these questions, we'd spend less time circling in meetings trying to um, resolve one person's idea versus another, right? Often customers have much quicker ways of solving those problems than we do. Yeah, yeah. I have I have the million dollar question of uh, the next one, and it's I think it's uh, along with the other ones also like a really interesting one. Uh, in your experience, and you've seen a number of companies how UX evolved uh, over time. Um, what was your strategy uh, to improve UX maturity uh, in the companies that you worked at? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, at its basis, it's about um, building trust. So it's about people believing that what you're saying and what you're helping them answer questions for, that they they believe you. So I typically would um, tell researchers who would join my team um, that their first thing to do is to identify the immediate pain point that that team is feeling and find a way to solve it. So even though they know that this team needs personas and this team needs a, a user test or they need a bunch of other things, um, maybe they have a feature that's launching in three weeks and they don't know if it's going to be successful. Like, how do you answer some quick things for them so that you can build up that trust? And then for the next thing, you can be like, hey, how about we do X a little earlier, right? And then you start expanding um, the scope of your work and expanding uh, the maturity and variety of work that happens. Um, and then over time, you can start doing a wider variety of user experience activities. Um, typically, when I've joined companies in the past, they've been doing a lot of um, what I would call one-time feature studies. So it's very much, a, you know, I have a feature, I need it studied kind of things. And then we try and expand out to um, uh, one-time uh, deeper dive studies, and then also um, regular feature studies, regular deep dive studies. And then you just kind of start to say, well, here, we're using more of our toolkit over time. But it's very hard to do it independent uh, immediately. You have to build it over time. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I interesting. Uh, also, an interesting question on on uh, visualization uh, in UX and data analysis. Uh, could you share what frameworks you find most valuable? Um, and if you see like any differences uh, in case of like earlier stage startups and large corporations. Yeah. yeah, I I don't know that I think that there's a silver bullet here for frameworks for data analysis and visualization. So I've seen just huge numbers of things um, and it really depends on what speaks to your audience on like how you can communicate about the story you're trying to tell about the data. Um, I, I once had a researcher who um, jokingly said that um, she was writing reports, long documents, right? And she said, if I put it in a spreadsheet, I bet the product managers would read it. Um, and so the next time she didn't write the report, she put it in a spreadsheet. And actually she got a lot more readers. <laughs> so I don't, I don't know that there's a perfect item, but like if, if your team really digests video super well, use video. If visualizations are good, do that. If um, storytelling through um, maps is important for your work, because maybe it has something to do with that, like try different things. Um, someone at our, um, our company recently um, did a bunch of short videos on a bunch of data analysis they'd done as kind of a primer. And actually they started using that as a um, onboarding tool for their team later for how do you understand our customers? So um, I don't I don't have any any perfect examples that I use all the time. I think you gave a, like a good uh, range of uh, possibilities uh, here. Uh, I'd like to navigate to uh, like a different topic and a more operational one about yeah. uh, how how to decide uh, which questions to ask, like how to how you craft your questions to get the data you're looking for. Yeah, so I think the one there's a couple of general guidelines. So one, if you're doing an interview, you want to uh, start by building rapport. So it's a very ask questions at the beginning that are really not that key um, to what you're trying to discover or are general things that will help you understand the data. So, you know, tell me about yourself a little bit, you know, oh, if it's a travel related thing, oh, what was the recent trip you took? Keep it very broad um, and then work your way down to this narrow and specific. So you don't wanna ask about a specific piece of feedback and then go broad, you know, and tell me generally how you travel, but you wanna go tell me how you travel Tell me about the last flight you booked. How was that flight? Did you have, you know, go very specific over time. So you funnel it. Um, and if there's data that you feel like is um, like uh, that, you, if you ask it, you're not sure that the answer that you'll get will be um, uh, su super um, accurate. People don't intentionally lie most of the time, but they want to tell you a story that you like. So um, when I used to interview Uber drivers, we'd be like, okay, tell me about driving for Uber. And they'd say, um, well, I wish I made more money. That was usually the first thing they said. And um, then uh, they'd be like, but I like it. And you'd be like, come on, <laughs> you don't like everything about it. Tell me. And then they'd be like, yeah, it's true. I don't like blah and I don't like blah. And you're like, and then you get them, like you have to build the rapport and you have to get them, but yeah. I probably wouldn't get to what they really didn't like unless I probed of it. Yeah, but I, I think you also hint at like having an eye for the body language and for the intonation to like feel that you can scratch the surface here and, yeah. and covers uh, and discovers something more. Um, I, two more questions, two less questions. Okay, Molly. Uh, yeah. um, and the next one I picked about uh, when you run the large scale research via surveys, do you also leverage qual research uh, and how you get around sample sizes for, for yeah. qual, qual research? So two topics. So I've done enough qual research that I know that um, 
if you have a targeted sample, so you know you're talking to your target market and you are um, asking the right kinds of questions, by customer number six, you are absolutely gonna get repeat information. And that's usually the sign of qual research that is well-targeted um, and getting you the data you want. Um, the other, th and yes, we often do a qual element there. Um, everything we collect is data, but I actually prefer the term evidence-driven over data-driven because when you put a bunch of data together and you triangulate it, you get evidence, evidence that you can use for decision-making. And that's um, qual data is valid data, right? Because six people experienced it doesn't mean that it is not a, a valid experience, right? It just means that you need to validate it against the survey data. Um, or you make some basic decisions based on it and then you reevaluate that. So qual data is, um, yeah, it's uh, thick data, not big data. Um, and I, I find in general, if you um, show people um, how um, rich and valid it is, and particularly if you're talking to the right, um, you know, kind of customers, if you, if you ask random people, then qual data probably isn't going to be super valuable. But if you're asking uh, your target market, those qual it's just as valid um, as big numbers data. Amazing. Last question from uh, Melissa, and, and I know I'm I'm sorry. Some of you also ask questions and put in there. We won't have time for that. Um, I urge you to to get in touch with Molly or get in touch with uh, with myself. Don't forget your questions, throw them at us, and uh, we're happy to, to engage with you afterwards. The question from Melissa is, uh, is your thoughts about like case studies to hire someone for entry-level uh, yeah. researcher? So uh, what we would typically look for is someone who has a really good understanding of experimental methodology, so about the things that would affect the outcomes of an experiment, right? So uh, sample size, uh, how did they recruit? Who did they recruit? How did they make sure that they were getting a valid group of people for the research? Um, at um, one of my previous employers, we used to ask people to do a small case study, um, like you're describing here. Maybe this is one that comes in without background, but um, and then we would talk to them about, okay, what if uh, we had shorter time frame? What if we had a longer time frame? What if we had more people? What if we had less people trying to understand if they had a sense of the impacts that that would have on the quality of the data, on the believability of the findings. Um, uh, I had someone once send back a case study and say they were going to interview 40 people in one week. To me, that was not realistic. <laughs> um, and so I was like, this person does not know how to conduct research. Because if you do six in a day, you're going to be completely wiped, like 40 in a week. That's like not even humanly possible unless there's like eight of you. So um, I, trying and that's to even for a, for a, for a sales rep. That's a, that's quite an achievement uh, yeah. in a week. Yeah. So like looking for those things that help point you to um, their understanding and then also asking them what their assumptions were. Did they assume that they would have easy access to customers? Did they assume X, Y, and Z about the people they talked to? So um, usually if you can poke at a study, um, you know, researchers will say there's no perfect study. There's just the perfect study for the conditions and the restrictions that you have. And so can they uh, articulate that? I think that's... Uh the best final words I could have wished for. Uh, we reached the end of the, end of the webinar. Uh, Molly, I'm eternally grateful for you to, to join me for this discussion. There's a, a lot I believe I learned as well as the audience uh, today. Seeing from the activity and the number of questions, there's like people were really e eager uh, and, and, uh, and found uh, your, your insights very, very valuable. Um, so thanks again. I hope to see you again some, uh, sometime in the future. And in the yeah. meantime, uh, the best uh, to you and uh, see you around. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure.
Thanks a lot. And take care, everyone in the audience. Thanks for being with us uh, today and uh, join our next webinar, which is going to be March the 12th. I'll circulate uh, the details about that. Take care, everyone.